Okay, just as an identification on the tape, can I? Could you just give me your name and position here? Yeah. My name is uh, uh, Robert Gallo, Bob. <laughs> My position is Chief of the Laboratory of Tumor Cell Biology. At the moment, I'm also Scientific Director for the Cause of AIDS at the National Cancer Institute in Bethesda, part of NIH, the National Institutes of Health. And we know that there are at least three subgroups now. One that we call subgroup one is important for an aggressive type of T-cell malignancy that clusters in southern Japan throughout the Caribbean, parts of Central and South America and Southeastern United States. It occurs in Europe, particularly in the Caribbean immigrants for example, in London or in England in general. Type 2, or subgroup 2, we've only identified in a few people. A hairy cell leukemia of a T-cell type in a white young man from Seattle, Washington, who lived in Alaska for a while. Uh, I won't talk further about type 2. It's, a very, it, it's also T-tropic, that is, has an affinity to infect T-cells. It can also immortalize some. It can also reduce the function of others. So it's very functionally like HTLV-1, but the genome is substantially different. It's, it also has the X region, or PX region, uh, so it has some important features in common with HTLV-1. HTLV-3, a third subgroup, we've isolated over the last year. We have about 50 isolates of it, and we believe it's involved in AIDS in a very important way. And that'll be a story that'll be coming out shortly in a series of papers in science. Uh, um, fine. Um, so could you go into a little bit more detail uh, about this type 3 H human T-cell leukemia virus? Then? Okay, we've isolated it, as I said, we have about, fi uh, well, let me rephrase that. We have about 50 isolates, and they come from patients with AIDS or pre-AIDS, that is, that is people who have risk of developing AIDS who already have symptoms that are the beginning of AIDS as defined here in the United States. And we've also isolated it from mothers of children with AIDS uh, in very high percentage. With AIDS cases, our success rate now is close to 40%. You know, it's very difficult to find virus in all because by the late stage disease, there are hardly any T cells left. In mothers of AIDS patients, we've isolated it from 75%. Uh, in uh, high risk groups, we've isolated it from uh, even more percent, more than that. I, I forget the exact statistic right now. Um, we've characterized the virus uh, partially. It clearly belongs to the HTLV family. It's related uh, to both HTLV 1 and 2. It hybridizes across the genome. That is, there's nucleic acid similarities across the whole genome of HTLV 1 and 2, but it also has important differences, including some structural, morpholo structural differences by electron microscopy. Um, the virus is more infectious than HTLV 1 or 2. It is also highly T-cell tropic, that is, has a strong affinity to infect T-cells, especially the T4 subclass, which are the cells involved in AIDS. We know that it has a stronger cytopathic effect than HTLV-1 or 2. That is, when upon infection, uh, we don't get the, any of the cells immortalized. When these cells get infected, they, they don't lice or burst, but they just don't grow anymore, and they eventually die out in culture, even with our best T-cell growth factor. So the in vitro data strongly fit the picture of AIDS. The most important, however, has been serological studies. Serological studies, uh, by that I mean antibodies in the serum of people with AIDS or pre-AIDS or contacts of them or high-risk groups. That has really broken open the, the story, in my view. Uh, close to 90% of the AIDS patients have antibodies to this virus. Less than 1% of normal heterosexuals have antibody. All the risk groups have a certain significant percent, 10 or 20 or 30, like hemophiliacs, um, promiscuous homosexual populations, um, a significant percent are positive, pre-AIDS patients close to 90 percent, um, Haitians fairly high percent, at least of the small study we've done in Haitians, and, mo and, and most interesting, we have by chance some prospective studies. We have followed some people before they had the disease, and we isolate virus and find antibody before the development of the disease. Uh, this, for example, in a normal homosexual has happened a few times. Babies who are diagnosed as AIDS that didn't have antibody to any other virus have high titer antibody to this, so before there was any opportunistic infections. So this, this kind of thing clearly argues uh, overwhelmingly that this virus causes the disease, in my view. Does it follow, though, that all people who've got the virus are going to develop AIDS? No, we cannot say that, of course. Uh, that's impossible without following these people for, the, you know, closely over a period of time. I hope, I surely hope not, because there's, there's too 
significant of a number that we found antibody. One of the things is when you have antibody, you're not necessarily sure you have virus. But if you isolate virus uh, so frequently as we have in the pre-AIDS, uh, the question is, will we isolate it as frequently in the at-risk groups where we find antibody, or is it just that they were exposed to some protein and made antibody, or are they really infected? If the antibody response is continuous, it's likely they are infected. Only time will tell if what the, uh, what I don't know what to call the word, the ratio, I get, you would say, of disease to infection is. I surely hope it's not one-to-one. -one. one of the key features of AIDS is an upset in the ratio of helper to suppressor T cells. Can you explain how the virus might affect that? Yeah, because the virus is predominantly tropic for the T4 cells. And when, upon infection, these cells don't live that long. They're the helper cells. They're, yeah, they're, well, a helper in, is, a, is a loose term. T4 cells are predominantly helper, but there are other subsets that can function as suppressor or have no function at all. So I just let's call them T4 cells. The T4 cells get infected. T4 cells uh, um, uh, go down in number, and that fits what we know from the in vitro study. The T4 cells or some subsets also release T cell growth factor. If you don't have enough T4 cells releasing T T cell growth factor, then you're going to drop other T cells as well, and that's exactly what occurs in AIDS. Ever since AIDS was first noticed, people have been looking for such a virus as a cause, and yes. this has been always a possibility. Why has it taken so long to isolate it for sure? Well, I, I, in a sense, I, you know, we are for, we've had the isolates for some time now. We just couldn't prove that it, until recently that it was the uh, so clearly linked to the disease. Obviously, we immediately went after viruses of the HTLV family for a number of reasons. Our thinking was this. This disease was infectious despite some of the uh, peculiar models that were being proposed in some quarters I, I, that I never really fully understood. There were all kinds of things proposed as the cause of AIDS, but I think from the start it was apparent that this was an infectious disease. Second, if it was an infectious disease, it was fairly evident in time that it was most likely viral, not something like a fungus or bacteria. And that comes from studies of filter uh, the way that uh, the, well, just from a number of negative studies for bacteria and fungi, and also from the kind of, of mat human materials that can cause the disease, that blood products, that it would be unlikely that a, that a um, bacteria or fungus would be in such material. So we focused on a virus. Thirdly, we knew from animal models, the cat leukemia especially, that a, that a retrovirus, a leukemia virus, that causes a T-cell leukemia can also cause the opposite an acquired immune deficiency syndrome, depending on subtle modifications of the genome and or dose, root, or age of infection. In fact, cat leukemia virus more often causes an AIDS-like disease than it does leukemia. Thirdly, we knew HTLV was extremely tropic for T cells and specifically T4 cells. We knew it was unlikely to be HTLV of the subgroup 1 itself, the virus that we had most studied in our laboratory, because that is prevalent in parts, some parts of the world where AIDS was not found. For example, it's also prevalent in uh, southern Japan, and there was no AIDS there. And therefore, we assumed that the, the, the most likely hypothesis, and the one that we were testing was that it was a variant of HTLV1. Well, what took us so long was this. We got many samples where, in retrospect, we had this virus isolated, but we couldn't be sure of it because we had indications that virus was there, but that we couldn't grow the cells. Normally, we can grow cells and look at the HTLV isolates we obtain. We couldn't grow these because of the cytopathic effects of the virus were more severe on the cells. So we couldn't grow the cells long enough to analyze the virus. And we, bec we, we became frustrated. We thought it was our own technical difficulties or that the people who were sending us the clinical material from AIDS patients were sending us lousy material, <laughs> poor material. And so we didn't know what to do with all these isolates. We could never characterize them adequately. Well, we made what I would call a reasonable advance about eight, nine months ago. We developed a cell line in our laboratory which is susceptible to infection by these viruses in which mass produces this virus and doesn't have the cytopathic effect as a consequence. Therefore, for the first time, we could mass produce it. We could develop reagents, antibodies, molecular probes, and go back and analyze all the ones that we couldn't grow and we will type them as the same, and it became evident. We could also get enough proteins by mass-producing the virus to develop serological assays. That is, having the proteins mass-produced, because you have the virus mass-produced, allows you to get the proteins purified, allows you to do antibody assays in patient sera. That's what, was all, what happened in those last several months. Now that you have done all that, does that mean that you've got enough information to work towards, for example, a vaccine, or dare I even say a treatment? Yes, I think so. I, I mean, I, I, I don't say we'll have it. I can, I'm not going to be a, uh, a, a, a 
with a presumptuous uh, predictor, uh, but I only say we, we, we certainly have ideas from this now of what to do, and I, and I hope we'll be successful in collaboration with many people.